believing. I was now at prodigious height, far above the accursed branches of the wood. I dragged myself up from the floor and fumbled about for windows that I might look for the first time upon the sky and the moon and stars of which I had read. But on every hand I was disappointed since all that I found were vast shelves of marble bearing odious oblong boxes of disturbing size. More and more I reflected and wondered what hoary secrets might abide in this high apartment, so many ions cut off from the castle below. Then, unexpectedly, my hands came upon a doorway, where there hung a portal of stone, rough with strange chiseling. Trying it, I found it to be locked, but with a supreme burst of strength I overcame all obstacles and dragged it open inward. As I did so, there came to me the purest ecstasy I've ever known, for shining tranquilly through an ornate grating of iron and down a short stone passageway of steps that ascended from the newly found doorway was the radiant full moon, which I had never before seen save in dreams and in vague visions I dared not call memories, fancying now that I had attained the very pinnacle of the castle. I commenced to rush up the few steps beyond the door, but the sudden veiling of the moon by a cloud caused me to stumble, and I felt my way more slowly in the dark. It was still very dark when I reached the grating, when I tried carefully and found unlocked, which I tried very carefully and found unlocked, but which I did not open for fear of falling from the amazing height to which I had climbed. Then the moon came out. Most demia most demoniacal of all shocks is that of the abysmal, unexpected, and grotesquely unbelievable. Nothing I had before undergone could compare in terror with what I now saw, with the bizarre marvels at the, that sight implied. The sight itself was as simple as it was stupefying, for it was merely this, instead of a dizzying prospect of treetop seen from a lofty eminence, there stretched around me on the level through the grating nothing less than the solid ground, decked and diversified by marble slabs and columns, and overshadowed by an ancient stone church, whose ruined spire gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. With the fall of uh, Christianity as the majority faith of America, um, which it's approaching to be the case, if it's not already the case, I haven't seen statistics um, 52% were Christians, so it could, might not be a Christian majority anymore. We're going to see a lot more uh, ruined churches. Half unconscious, I opened the grating and staggered out upon the white gravel path that stretched away in two directions. My mind, stunned and chaotic as it was, still ha held the frantic craving for light, and not even the fantastic wonder which had happened could stay my course. I neither knew nor cared whether my experience was insanity, dreaming, or magic, but was determined to gaze on brilliance and gaiety at any cost. I knew not who I was, or what I was, or what my surroundings might be, though as I continued to stumble along, I became conscious of a kind of fearsome, latent memory that made my progress not wholly fortuitous. I passed under an arc out of that region of slabs and columns, I wandered through the open country, sometimes following the visible road, but sometimes leaving it curiously to tread across meadows where only occasional ruins bespoke the ancient presence of a forgotten road. Once I swam across a swift river where crumbling, mossy masonry told of a bridge long vanished. Over two hours must have passed before I reached what seemed to be my goal, a venerable, ivied castle in a thickly wooded park, maddeningly, maddeningly familiar, yet full of perplexing strangeness to, me, strangeness to me. I saw that the moat was filled in and that some of the well-known towers were demolished, whilst new wings existed to confuse the beholder. But what I observed with chief interest and delight were the open windows 
gorgeously ablaze with light and sending forth the sound of the gayest reverie. Advancing to one of these, I looked in and I saw an oddly dressed company indeed making merry and speaking brightly to one another. I had never seemingly heard human speech before and could guess only vaguely what was said. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that brought up incredibly remote collections. Others were utterly alien. I now stepped through the low window into the brilliantly lighted room, stepping as I did so from my single bright moment of hope to my blackest convulsion of despair and realization. The nightmare was quick to come, for as I entered there occurred immediately one of the most terrifying demonstrations I had ever conceived. Scarcely I had crossed the sill when there descended upon the whole company a sudden and unheralded fear of hideous intensity distorting every face and evoking the most horrible screams from nearly every throat. Flight was universal, and in the clamor and panic several fell in a swoon and were dragged away by their madly fleeing companions. Many covered their eyes with their hands and plunged blindly and awkwardly in their race to escape, overturning furniture and stumbling against the walls before they managed to reach one of the many doors. The cries were shocking, and as I stood in the brilliant apartment, alone and dazed, listening to their vanishing echoes, I trembled at the thought of what might be lurking near me, unseen. At a casual inspection, the room seemed deserted, but when I moved toward one of the alcoves, I thought I detected a presence there, a hint of motion beyond the golden arched doorway leading to another and somewhat similar room as I approached the arch, I began to perceive the presence more clearly. And then, with the first and last sound I ever uttered, a ghastly ululation that revolted me, almost as poignantly as its noxious cause, I beheld in full, frightful vividness, the inconceivable, indescribable, and unmentionable monstrosity, which had by its simple appearance changed a merry company to a herd of delirious fugitives. I cannot even hint what it was like, for it was a compound of all that is unclean, uncanny, unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. It was the ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and dissolution, the putrid, dripping eidolon of unwholesome revelation, the awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. God knows it was not of this world are no longer of this world, yet to my horror I saw in its eaten away and bone-revealing outlines a leering, abhorrent travesty on the human shape, and in its moldy, disintegrating apparel, an unspeakable quality that chilled me even more. I was almost paralyzed, but not too much, so to make a feeble effort toward flight, a backward stumble which failed to break the spell, in which the nameless voiceless monster helped me. My eyes bewitched by the glassy orbs which stared loathsome, uh, loathsomely into them, refused to close, though they were mercifully blurred, and showed the terrible object but indistinctly after the first shock. shock. I tried to raise my hand to shut out the sight, yet so stunned were my nerves that my arm could not fully obey my will. The attempt, however, was enough to disturb my balance, so that I had to stagger forward several steps to avoid falling. As I did so, I became suddenly and antagonizingly aware of the nearness of the carry-on thing, whose hideous hollow breathing I half fancied I could hear. Nearly mad, I found myself yet able to throw out a hand to ward off the fetid apparition which pressed so close and in one cataclysmic second of cosmic nightmarishness and hellish accident my fingers touched the rotting, outstretched paw of the monster beneath the golden arch. I did not shriek, but all the fiendish ghouls that ride the night wind shrieked for me, as in the same second there crashed down upon my mind a single and fleeing avalanche of soul-annihilating memory. I knew in that second all that had been I remembered beyond the frightful castle and the trees and recognized the altered edifice in which I now stood. I recognized most terrible of all the unholy abomination that stood leering before me as I withdrew my sullied fingers from its own. But in the cosmos, 
there is balm as well as bitterness. And that balm is Nepenthe. Nepenthe? In the supreme horror of that second, I forgot what had horrified me, and the burst black memory vanished into a chaos of echoing images. In a dream, I fled that haunted and accursed pile. and ran swiftly and silently in the moonlight. When I returned to the churchyard place of marble, I went down the steps. I found the store, the st I, <clears throat> I found the stone trap door, immovable, but I was not sorry, for I had hated the antique castle and trees. Now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls on the night wind and play by day amongst the catacombs of Nefren Ka in the sealed and unknown valley of Hadoth by the Nile. I know that light is not for me, save that of the moon, over the rock tombs of Neb, nor any gaiety save the unnamed feast of Nictrochus beneath the great pyramid. Yet, in my new wildness and freedom, I almost welcome the bitterness of alienage. For, although... Nepenthe has calmed me. I know always that I am an outsider, a stranger in this century, and among those who are still men. This I have known ever since I stretched out my fingers to the abomination within that great gilded frame, stretched out my fingers and touched a cold and unyielding surface, a polished glass. And the Shayok team and all Jin can certainly uh, take on pretty horrifying forms and influence dreams.